Hello and welcome to the video version of Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar and located at warscholar.org. We talk about military history from ancient to modern and everything in between. I'm Chris Alvarez and thank you for watching. I'm speaking with George Ann Burledge, editor of Living in the Shadow of a Hell Ship, the, su the survival story of U.S. Marine George Burledge, a World War II prisoner of war of the Japanese published by University of North Texas Press, August 27, 2020. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you for having me. So first, um, obviously, you're, well, you're a relation of, uh, of Mr. Burledge. Um, what, tell me the story of what inspired you to, what helped you put, to, put this book together? Well, of course, I grew up hearing my dad's stories. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know the details of them, but I heard, you know, I heard the basics of the stories and he used to speak to my classes. I was a history teacher and, you know, I knew the basics, um, but he always left things out. You know, he didn't want to make it as gruesome as it could have been, I guess. Mm -hmm. And after he passed away, a friend of mine and I were cleaning out his stuff. You know, one of the sad things you have to do. Mm -hmm. I'm an only child, so it had to be me. And we found a Rubbermaid, one of those big tubs full of writings and um, full of things from his, his Marine Corps experiences and so forth. Mm -hmm. I knew that he was a writer. He was a journalist by trade. He was, you know, that, that was his degree he was in. Um, I, I could see him working on his legal pad a lot, scribbling stuff, but I had no idea to the extent of things that he had written. Um, I, I kept telling him, you know, you gotta write your story. You gotta write your story. And he'd say, nobody cares. Say, I'm an old man, happened 60 years ago. No one cares. Well, after I retired from teaching, I decided I'm going to tell a story. It needs to be told. And I think what makes this book a little bit different is that it really gets into his emotions and his thoughts and his, his schemings. You know, it was, it's a very personal book. Mm -hmm. So um, it's interesting that he, he was a journalist and yet this particular story, he, did he share any, did he write at all about World War II? Yeah, he did. Um, when he was in the Marines, you know, he, he re-enlisted after the war. Now, I was not born until 1955, so I don't remember any of these. Mm -hmm. But he re-enlisted, and what he told me once was that he went to his, you know, commander, whoever, whatever rank, and said, I've really learned to do nothing in the Marines would be a POW and a sniper. I'd like to have some, some kind of talent, you know, talent appraisal or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they found out that he was a really good writer. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they still do it, but the... Marines used to send their, 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 their promising journalists to a school called the Naval School of Journalism okay. at Great Lakes, and it was through Northwestern University. Mm -hmm. He attended that, he graduated first in his class, and he was hired by Leatherneck Magazine. That, okay. that, that is the, the uh, official publication of the United States Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So he did a lot of writing for them. For I think four years he wrote for them. He went to Korea, wrote, wrote about the, the war correspondent, and when he was in Korea, he did go back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. and write a 10th anniversary story about Corregidor and Bataan, and that's in, part of that's in the book. Mm -hmm. But he didn't, he didn't focus his whole thing on that. No. You know, he did PR work and features and everything. Mm -hmm. He wrote a few things. And also, he wrote some stuff for the, our local newspaper in Denton. That's okay. about it. Okay. So, and I'll just show the book. I didn't show it before. Um, I don't know. If, oh, I guess my... I'll show it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My virtual background is making a mess. Of it. So yeah, yeah. There it is. Um, this is his re-enlistment picture. He's uh, twenty-eight. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so just looking through the book, um, obviously it's a very personal story. Um, you know, it starts out when before a, a couple of years before the war, um, before any of this happened, and then mm -hmm. I guess it goes through his three years of captivity, where right. Uh, through brutal conditions, um, I guess. What did um, had, it, it, did you include everything he wrote, or did you? How much did you have to edit? I included most. Mm -hmm. There were some things that were, I must say, not politically correct. That's kind of you know broad, making it broad. But to say his opinions were very, uh, mm -hmm. I can't word this right. Um, if it were really, really negative about a certain group of people, I didn't put it in. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Though I think, you know, 
to be to be fair, the Marine Corps was pretty uh, infused with um, anti-Japanese uh, thinking. You know, was it, that that was how they were taught to you know about but, them and to attack well, them. I never blamed him for having some kind of animosity. You know, because he did go through some horrendous things. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, as he got older, he let it go. Mm -hmm. He let his anger go. Okay. And in fact, I, I, I bought a Mazda and he went, oh, whatever, you know, <laughs> it was like, but it took him quite a few years, I think, to, to really work out the anger. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But, you know, I say his last 30 years or so, you know, you want to say I'm over it. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Um, he was so not bitter. He, he, let's say he, he was not a bitter man. He wasn't bitter. Interesting. Um, I guess in a sense, it seems like some people who weren't there seem to have more bitterness in, in some respects than the people who were there and went through it and then just said Exactly. It. And he wrote about his last place where he was. He was on the hell ship and then he got sent to Japan on the hell ship. Mm -hmm. And he worked in a mine way up in northern Japan. Mm -hmm. And he became friends with a lot of the civilian guards there because he said they were going through exactly what he was. They were starving. They were cold. You know, they were isolated mm -hmm. and he began to see them as, as people, you know, they, they, they weren't out to get him. They were just people that he was working with. Mm -hmm. I think that that also changed a lot of, you know, a, mm -hmm. a lot of his views. How did, um, so how was he able to record his story? Just, is it mostly memory for the three years and then he wrote it down or? As, yeah. He also did an oral history with the um, University of North Texas. Mm -hmm. in 1970 I think it was mm -hmm. and I, I did I did use parts of that when I had a question about a fact or a date or something mm -hmm. I did use that but um well it was mainly his writings and mm -hmm. his articles he wrote he was in the Marines mm -hmm. so you know, um, a little bit a little bit of what I knew too. Mm -hmm. oh, okay you so did you add certain things that um so, so certain memories that he might not have written down, but he did talk well, to you thing about. I added was some things that happened in the hell ship. Mm -hmm. Can you, so tell me about the hell ship. What, what exactly is that? You know, that's what I've been asked by more people because I had a lot of you know, friends and people who are buying the book mm -hmm. and they say, we never heard of the hell ships. Mm -hmm. So I figure I kind of made my, my point here, but um, can, can I, just, can I tell you why I chose the title? Then I'll go back. Sure. Okay. Cause I think it's kind of important. Uh, as I said, my, my dad had let it go a long time ago. You know, mm -hmm. He had let it go. He was very busy with my, with my kids and community and church and everything. And he lived to be over 90. And he had, a, he had to have surgery on a hernia. It was Thanksgiving night, eight, I had the wrong century, 20, <laughs> 2008. Mm -hmm. And um, he never snapped out of the, of the surgery. And he was just kind of there. And one night I got called from the hospital and they said, you have to get over here. He's dying. And he's, mm. and he's very delusional. Mm. So I said, sure, you know, I have to, you know, so I went over there to the hospital and he was clawing, he was clawing in his bed, clawing, going, don't do this to me. I've got to get out of here. I've got to get out of here. Get away from me. Get away from me. And the nurse said, what's going on? I said, he's reliving his hell ship experiences. Mm. He spent almost 40 days in the bottom of the ship. And um, that was the last thing he ever said was, get away from me, get away, get away from me. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was embedded in him somewhere. Mm -hmm. It really was embedded in him. But the hell ship was when MacArthur and his troops finally came back to the Philippines after two and a half years mm -hmm. in the fall of 44, uh, the Japanese, you know, the, the Americans thought, hey, we're, we're, we're liberated, we're out of here. <laughs> you know? No, they took the more able-bodied men. And my dad at the time weighed about 120 pounds. Mm -hmm. from a pre-war weight of 200 pounds. Oh, he was wow. able-bodied, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they stuffed on the bottom of ships and took him to Japan to work. And some were taken to China, but my dad was taken to Japan. And to make matters worse, the Americans were reinvading the Philippines at the time. And so they were flying over the South China Sea to go into the Philippines. And they were bombing these ships because oh. they, they were marked as Japanese ships. They weren't marked as POW ships. Uh, and oh, I forgot the percentage. I pulled it out. How many were killed aboard the hell ships? Oh, here we are. 55,000 were put aboard. 10,800 were killed. Wow. A fifth of these men were killed. I have a really good friend whose dad was killed on one. And um, he was down there for 38 days. His captain, 
decided to just go into Taiwan and stay there until it was safer to go to Japan. Mm-hmm. And that may have saved him. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But um, they were given, the uh, Japanese put him in the hull, hold, hold, right, hold mm-hmm. the ship. Yep. And then they sealed it up with boards and canvas and stuff like that. And then they would lower like a bucket of water and a bucket of food. And so these, these men would fight over it. And my father being, in, only my father was very ca- calculated. You know, he'd look over the situation and try to figure out what to do. And he told me that he got in the corner, he got in the corner of the, of the hull, of the hull, I'm sorry. And he thought, well, if we get hit by a torpedo, I might be able to get out that way. <laughs> well, I'll, t- I'll tell you what happened to those who got out of these ships. <laughs> but he sat there and he said he watched it. He just watched all he could. And he didn't, because he was try- trying to stay out of the fights. Men were attacking other men. They were so thirsty. They were drinking you know, blood. Uh, and it was just awful. I, mean, I can't imagine. So, so, so it's called a hell ship for a reason. Uh, and so he said when it really got bad was when they were docked in Taiwan because they, they weren't allowed off the ships. And they could hear the bombing, bombing in the, in the harbor, Taiwan. I can't remember the name of the city. But um, he had a friend aboard who was a vet, veterinarian. Wasn't much need for them in the prison camps. But anyway, he was a veterinarian. And he had smuggled morphine on board. Hmm. And, he, and my dad said he took the morphine, he broke it in half, and he said, here, George, let's, let's just end it. And this sounds so much like my dad. I mean, I laughed when I read this sentence in his writings. He said, no, I think I'm going to stick around and see how this turns out. <laughs> that, that was my dad. He would never give up. Yeah. But they wound up in Moji, Moji Japan. Mm-hmm. And that's where they, they were taken off the ships in Moji. They think they stayed in Taiwan for two or three weeks. Then they went to Moji and then they started working in the mine. But you just think about the worst circumstances you could imagine. No food, no light, no water, men going crazy around you, and you're trying to stay sane. That's the hell ship. Wow, that's, yeah. It's... My friend whose dad died, this is not part of the book, but it's real quickly. Um, mm-hmm. they, m- most of those Americans got off the ships and the Japanese machine gunned them. Wait, say, repeat that? I think I missed it. It, it was the Arison Maru that my friend's dad was on. Uh. When it was hit, most of the Americans got out of the ship. Mm-hmm. And the Japanese had machine guns and they were killing them. As oh. they came out of the water, they were killing them. As they were escaping from the sinking ship. Mm-hmm. And there were two or three who got to a lifeboat, maybe four, no more than four. And they made it to China. And part, part of China was still occupied by the Allies. And these men were immediately taken to Washington, D.C. to tell what had happened. Their yeah. But that's probably the first that anybody knew about the POWs and what was wow. going on. Hmm. It was in the, the fall of 1944, I believe. <clears throat> oh, wow. Yeah. So I noticed, just flipping through the book, um, that uh, they did engage in some some acts of small acts of sabotage, you know, or well, delay. You have, to, you have to get back somehow, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> now, should I tell you about one of them? Sure, sure. Okay. Um, my dad was in Palawan. Palawan's a very isolated island off of Luzon, the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And um, they were, everywhere he went except for the mine, he was building an airfield. And they never finished these airfields because they, they didn't plan to finish them, to be honest. <laughs> and so anyway... One day, this uh, ship of supplies comes in. Uh, their port was called Port- Porta Princesa. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, the Japanese sent the POWs down to unload the ship for them, the boat. And they found a case of San Miguel beer. Uh-oh. Now, my dad loved San Miguel. Mm-hmm. When I went to the Philippines, I had plenty for him. You know, it was good. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's a good beer, really. Is. But anyway, and they began to, this is when the beer had caps on it. Caps, you know, like like my water bottle here, caps. Oh, okay. And um, they would drink one beer, put it back in the case, put the cap back on. Mm-hmm. And they worked their way through the case of the beer. Then they brought in the empty bottles and set them down and, you know, have a good party. I wish we could be there with you tonight. So the Japanese that night got ready to have their party. And one by one, they'd open the beers and go, what happened? <laughs> and they never suspected the POWs. They suspected it was a, a, something when it was being, you know, put together back in Manila. Uh-huh. And he said it was so funny just to watch them go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is it minor sabotage? They weren't killing anybody or hurting anybody. Just having a little bit of fun. Yeah. 
and they would they made up names for the um, guards. They had Donald Duck. He said, "Who's Donald Duck?" And they said, "A famous Hollywood star." Then they then he found out it was a duck, cartoon duck. And he was real happy about that. Um, also, that they would sabotage their work. Mm -hmm. uh, they had built. A, they finally finished an airfield at Las Pinas, which is near where the old Nichols Field was near Manila. In fact, it's, it's near where the um, airport is now. Mm -hmm. And so the Japanese would have an air show. And they brought in their planes. And every time they landed, they went down like this because it was an uneven uh, field. Oh. They, were, they all went down and went crooked because the field, the, the Filipinos built half of it, Americans the other half, and they made sure it didn't meet right. <laughs> you know, it's little things to get back like that. Yeah, yeah. Little things. No, it makes sense. It gives you a sense of control, I think, a little bit, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. No, um, well, I also think it helps the war effort, you know. Um, you can't do a whole lot, obviously, because you'll get beaten or killed. Right. Or you just do what little be, bits. Maybe you're kind of secret about it, kind of subtle. Right, right. But the Japanese, they'd taken over all these islands, you know, in the South Pacific, and they had to get, they, they were going to build their airstrips, but I don't think anything ever got finished. Did he, um, were, were there any parts where he encountered um, other non-American allies? British, Australian, mm -hmm. Dutch. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, there was some on the hell ship with him. There were two, I think, who were British, and they had been they had been bombed on another hell ship, and they survived. So the Japanese just put, put them on their ship. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, the camp, the last camp he was in, had a, a lot of. Uh, they had some Scottish people in there, I know, and British. Did he get to interact with them much, or did they keep it segregated? No, I think they were all together. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, the only ones they segregated, he wrote, was. When they were, you know, they, the, the, the Japanese weren't expecting 60,000 people to surrender in the Philippines. Oh, they um, yeah, they, they, they were not expecting that, you know, because the Japanese followed the Code of Ushido, mm -hmm. which was that you fight till the death. And the Americans, you know, that, that wasn't what we, we did generally. Right. And so um, they segregated the Filipinos from the Americans at mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. And then also when he went to his first camp, and I have to think how to say this. Cabanatuan, Cabanatuan. Mm -hmm. They segregated the Bataan people from the Corregidor people because the Corregidor people were in better shape. Mm -hmm. they, they lasted an, a, a month later. Mm -hmm. They were in a little better shape. But as far as the Americans and the British and all that, no, they didn't do that. What was he eating there? Did he write about that? What, eating? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you can find. Um, mm -hmm. they, were, they were given rice. He never ate rice <laughs> as long as I knew him. That was a you know, long time. Uh, they had rice balls, a little bit of water, whatever they could find. And he said Palawan had fruit everywhere, growing wild in the Japanese garden. You can't eat the fruit, but they, they managed to get the fruit somehow. But there wasn't a whole lot of protein. Some fish maybe, but not a lot of protein. Right. So they just, and um, how much, I know there was one incident mentioned where he, he got sick. Um, how often was he dealing with sickness uh the only I me mean, i think he was sick probably the whole time to be honest but mm -hmm. uh when he got really really sick and they sent him to, to manila um off of palawan he had beriberi which is some some kind of vitamin deficiency disease mm -hmm. and malaria and something about malaria it, it comes back on you mm -hmm. and he, I, I can remember he'd have to go to bed sometimes because he, he didn't really have the whole blown case but it would come back a little bit Mm -hmm. You have to go. He was sweating it off or something, but a lot of a lot of vitamin deficiency diseases. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. did he um did he discuss at all how what they were hoping would happen as far as rescue? Did they have anything in mind, or were they just taking it day by day? Taking it day by day. I know they were very helpful when the um, when they saw that the planes come in mm -hmm. in the fall of forty four. They thought it was over. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he said that they were yelling at the pilots like, hey, you know, you, you had eggs for bacon, we had rice, you know, things like that. But after that, I think he was just like, you know. And they also found out the Japanese had a kill order. What's that? September 1st, 1945, because the Japanese thought by that time the, 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 the Americans would have invaded the mm -hmm. homeland. And they were afraid of these prisoners, these, these 100 pound prisoners, you know. Mm -hmm. We're going to fight with Americans. 
And so the order would have been to just kill them all. Kill the, yeah. And that did happen at Palawan uh, in December. And in fact, the anniversary, I think, was the 14th, December 14th, 1944. Mm -hmm. They thought the Americans were killed. That, that was on the western side of the Philippine Islands. Palawan. Mm -hmm. It'd been like the first place they would have gone in. And they, the Japanese got word the Americans were coming, which they weren't. And they killed all the prisoners. I think eight got out. Uh, eight or 11 escaped. Mm -hmm. One of them was a good friend of my dad's. He lived in East Texas. One of them was who escaped. It was quite a story. Oh. And in fact, they came through our town one time. We, we lived near Dallas, north, right north of Dallas. And he was begging, begging my, my father to write a story for him. And my dad said it was, and he just couldn't do it. It was just too, it was just too, too close. He couldn't do it. Now, your dad was, so I saw he was a Marine, uh, mm -hmm. a Master Sergeant. Right. Um, what, what was his rank when he was captured? He was a private, mm -hmm. but they promoted him during the war. He didn't know about it, but oh. he was a corporal when the war was over. Mm -hmm. I guess that's a nice little bonus when you come out of captivity. <laughs> a little bit, yeah, that and being ill. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what was, was his... Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, um, what was his, uh, his job? What was his... Um, what was he in the Marines before, before he was captured? He was stationed, he, okay, he enlisted in California. He, he was from California. Mm -hmm. And he finished boot camp on September 1st, 1939. That, that should have been a warning right there. But anyway, um, they say, yeah, really, they sent the Marines to a place called Cavite, C-A-V-I-T-E, mm -hmm. right by Manila. It, it was a, a Navy ship repair station. Mm -hmm. It's no longer there. It, it was wiped out on December 8th, 1941. It was wiped out. But um, he was an MP at Cavite. He, he, he said he, he rode a bicycle. <laughs> he was really pre-war. I mean, you know? yeah. And he kept saying it was like, like a tropical paradise. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, they would drink their San Miguel and break mm -hmm. up bar fights. It was, yeah. it was pretty cushy. Yeah. And he was supposed to do two years in the Philippines and come back and finish his term. Not term, that's like prison. His enlistment. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in on the mainland, and he was ready to be shipped out when, the, when they were attacked. So, okay, so he finished school on September 1st, so I guess his two years were... They were pretty much up. Yeah. He was uh, going to come back to the United States to finish. That kind of got stopped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so what else? Are, are there any other significant points in the book or, or things you discussed that we haven't touched on yet that you want to point out? Well, I could talk all day. Yeah, I'm a Texan. We talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> Please do. Feel free. But um, I just think one reason I wrote, I, I, didn't, I, I wrote part of it and the reason I edited the rest of it mm -hmm. was I just thought it was an incredible story. And I, mean, I was talking to my daughter when I was, you know, I was writing, I was talking to one of my daughters and I said, how do you think that people today, you know, they were isolated like that and they were, they were um, just abandoned, which these, these men were abandoned in the Philippines, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, totally abandoned. They got no reinforcements. They only had what they had. Even their general left them, you know, adios, I'll be back someday, you know, and we we're talking about that. And I said, how, how do you think that like, my students would do an award today? And she said, they, they would be t taking selfies. I thought about that, you know, they thought it would, you know, um, these men, they gave it all they had and they, they knew it was hopeless. They knew it was hopeless. Absolutely. It was hopeless. They knew it. They had no supplies. They had no reinforcements. My dad said when, on the night before Corregidor surrendered, uh, the Japanese brought in tanks and the Americans had World War I weapons. There weren't a lot of tanks in World War I. Right. It's, Asia especially, and they had no way to fight back. They were defenseless. Mm -hmm. Their weapons weren't even, you know, they had anti-aircraft weapons that couldn't even reach the planes. One thing he kept writing in this, in this stuff was that 52 planes came in and 52 planes went out. You know? huh. And I mean, they, they, could, they were just, everything was stacked against them, mm -hmm. but yet they kept fighting. And exactly. that just, it just amazes me. I mean, they just kept fighting to the end. And my dad said when he was on the beach at Corregidor, when they were surrendering, and uh, think about Corregidor, I, I went there for the uh, 75th anniversary of the fall of the Philippines. It was a, a group of POW descendants. 
-hmm. It's very, it's a small island and it's very, they have cliffs everywhere, you know, cliffs <laughs> overlooking the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. And he said that he was standing on those cliffs is watching the American flag come down and he thought, well, this is it, George. I have to make a decision. And I read this in, I read this in other books too, and I was doing my research. My dad said there were three categories of POWs. One, one were the ones that were injured or too sick to survive. There was a group that just sat down on the beach and went, well, forget it, I'm dead. I'll never make it. And most of them didn't make it. Then there was like my dad that said, uh-uh, no, 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 no. This is not gonna happen this way. <laughs> this is my life, my story. And I think that comes out in the book, how he, he fought to stay alive. I mean, he planned, he schemed, he fought. And that's what I came out with writing this was, I had a new, I mean, I, I always admired him. I, I knew he'd gone through a lot, but you know, it was a long time ago. He was 37 when I was born, you know. But just to know what he went through and never gave up, it's just, it's really something, you know. It's really, it's really a testament to those men, I think. Yeah. And it, really? gi it gives you an idea of what it takes to survive. You know, like you have to have a plan. You have to be ready to move forward. You can't, I mean, I guess there will be moments of despair, but in general, you know, you hold on and keep. You hold on. And he said when he was on that beach, and it was called the 92nd Garage, because it was where they used to keep the trucks and stuff hmm. on the island. And um, it was burning hot. That's so hot in the Philippines. <laughs> burning hot. They had one faucet for how many thousand men to drink out of. Oh, wow. And they had no food. There was, they didn't know what to do. And I don't, and I'll, honestly, I don't think that the Japanese knew what to do, you know, honestly. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, he looked around, he went, okay, George, get it together. You're, you're going to make this. And he stole a canteen of water mm -hmm. from, from a guard. And he said that gave him the courage and the hope that, you know, he, he could do it. But the only time he almost gave up was the hell ship. Because he had no control over that. Yeah. Maybe a little bit where he sat in the hole or something, but he didn't have any control over that. Right. Hoping for a torpedo to hit. Well, he describes, it's in, there, it's in the book, just sitting there in the dark and hearing those torpedoes in that water. Oh, he could hear them. He could hear them. Oh, wow. And then he heard um, death charges getting dropped. And he thought, well, George, <laughs> I think, I think you're, you've had it now. <laughs> but yeah, he could hear the depth charges. He could hear the torpedoes. He could hear the bombs. Sometimes the bombs were so close that the, the, the ship he was on just shook. Mm -hmm. thought, are we dead? Are we, did we make it? Oh, yeah. Wow. Wow, that's pretty And I'll tell you, he had a lasting effect from the war. It really wasn't health. He, 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 he always said he would die of a stomach problem, and he did. Mm -hmm. But he was 97 years old, too. So, you know. Yeah. But he said he was very, very claustrophobic. Afterwards? Very claustrophobic. It was from the ship. Huh. Um, he would not close blinds. We had to follow behind him, close the blinds in the house. Um, he had to fly a lot because he worked for the FAA. He did their, their um, PR work. Okay. And he would go, God, I'm not flying. <laughs> huh. But he'd get on the plane and he'd fly, but he didn't like elevators. Hmm. He would not, he always sat in the back of a theater or a church. You know? He had some little quirks like that that came from that, that experience in that ship. Wow. Wow. Um, so you know, I just want to add something. He, he came back. He finished college. He had two years in when he enlisted. He, he needed money. That's why he enlisted. Hmm. Came back and finished much later than he thought he would, but he finished in 1960. Hmm. And he had a master's. He, got, he earned a master's. You know, he had a good job. He always, he always told me, put it behind you. You got to put things like that behind you and go hmm. forward. You can't. If you don't, they win. Hmm. And that, that, was what, that is my philosophy of life, too. You know? yeah, that's a good lesson. Yeah. Good advice. But, you know, the whole time they were there, and this is another, I think, adds to the, to the, how impressive it is what they did. You don't know you're going to win. You don't know you're ever going to be released. You might be a prisoner for the rest of your life. You know, the Japanese end up winning and, you know, like you, you don't, you can have all the confidence in the world. Like, yes, our side will win, but you don't know. You don't know, yeah. or you don't have, you don't have, have a set exit. You, you don't know. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because but, but I guess no, no one really knows. Yeah. You know why? I mean, when you look back in history, you can say, oh, wow, they only, you know, they could, you know, they had two years of captivity, but they didn't know that, you know, that that was the extent of it. You know, they, they just knew that they're going to be there. And he, he, he wrote this somewhere. 
it's in the book somewhere, that they knew they would either survive the war and, and they, they would be saved by the Americans, finally, mm -hmm. or they would be killed by the Japanese. Mm -hmm. It would be one or the other. It would be, it'd be some, 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 some kind of salvation from the Americans or execution. Mm -hmm. Japanese, they, they could only see two ways out. Mm -hmm. So when you, couldn't, you couldn't escape. Yeah, not so, easier. Yeah. My, my dad had blonde hair. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no way he could have escaped and blended yeah. in. You know, you, you were just there. Was he tall as well? You said he was a, lot, a big guy, but he was a big guy, and he 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 never got any kind of clothes from the Japanese that fit him. Oh. <laughs> Always went right like below his knees or something. You know? Oh boy! That's and a... he would trade his food. He got he got you know they got so many rice balls, mm -hmm. and then they got so many cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Every every time I talk to somebody about this, I tell them they go. They got cigarette rations, you know, they got cigarette rations. Mm -hmm. And my dad never smoked. And he would trade his cigarettes for more food. And every time you tell that story, someone would go, well, that was mean. And you say, well, you know, if, if, if you're too whatever that you, you want to smoke instead of eat, fine, I'll take it. <laughs> you know? hey. Yeah, I mean, you yeah. know, you just have to figure out how to survive. Yeah. And they also hid had people in their, in their little bunks or bungalows, whatever they had, they would hide dead prisoners so they could get their food. Oh, wow. I mean, you, you just have to do what you have to do. Wow. That's, I had never heard of that. That's intense. Well, yeah, I think that's a, a trick in a lot of these situations, I think. Hmm. So let me, um, let me ask about the research you did. So obviously most, much of the book is um, based on your father's um, writings that you found. Yeah. But what else did you do to um, to add to the story? Where else did you go? I wrote that down. I was trying to get some notes together. Okay. Um, when I submitted this to UNT Press, I, I mean, I'm not an accomplished author. I was a teacher. You know? mm -hmm. I have a degree in journalism, but I have never published anything before. Mm -hmm. And so I sent it to them blind faith. You know, I mean, I, I did make contact with them before. I just emailed them. You know. And um, I, I knew there'd be a lot of editing to be done. I mean, I knew it. And there was. And what UNT, my editor there, wanted me to do was do more research on other POWs. I'm not, not individual, but types of POWs. Mm -hmm. Because the Japanese had POWs all over the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And so I did a lot on that. Um, you know, they had them in mines and in Indonesia. They had them doing this and that. They had them building airfields. They had them in mines in China. And in Korea, um, it was all slave labor, you know, mm -hmm. all slave labor. So I did a lot of research on that. Also on the psychological effects of being a POW. Mm -hmm. I had to do that, you know, I was told, I was asked, it was suggested I do that. Um, how it affects different people different ways, you know, being, being a captive. And I just did some, some basic research on, on the Philippines. I mean, the Philippines, the battles and the techniques and tactics and like that. So I, I could, tell the story better. So I, and the book has 46 illustrations or photos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where did you gather those from? Okay. My grandmother Burlidge, who I never met by the way, she kept everything that my father sent back for the Philippines. And um, so uh, some of that stuff is of things that aren't there anymore. Like like the the bases in the Philippines that got destroyed in World War I, World War Two. She kept every telegram. She kept the te telegram that I, I used to read in my classes because it says, you know, uh, your son is reported missing. Mm. He, we, we don't know, <laughs> we don't have the live or dead. And my students would go, did he make it? And I go, I'm here, aren't I? Come on, he made it. <laughs> I was born 10 years after the war ended. But you know, they get into that. And I'll say this, as a, as a mother, you know, when you look at things like that, she did not know for 18 months if her son were alive. I can't imagine that. I just can't imagine not knowing, you know, I don't know. But she kept everything, everything, every telegram, every letter from the War Department. She cut out clippings from her hometown paper in California. Mm -hmm. And that really helped in forming the story. It really helped. He got to, he got to mail back, I think it was two postcards all through the war, the whole entire war. And there were set ones that had little checks on them. I am well, I'm not well, you know. Mm -hmm. And she kept all of that. And then also some of the photos of my dad's. Um, he, when he went to the Philippines in 1952 and 1968, seven, mm -hmm. six or seven. Mm -hmm. or 
photos he took, and I found those were interesting because Baton and and Corregidor is set there in the in the same state they were when they when they fell. I mean, there had been no cleaning up, there had been no mm. no restoration, nothing. Five fifty two, and then when he went back in sixty seven, that they, they had done it. Mm. And then when I went in two thousand seventeen, it was like a tourist place. You know, mm. they had restaurants and stores and a little boat that went out there from Manila and all of that. Mm -hmm. But um, the photos are either ones that he took before the war or he took when he went back or when I went back. I went back when I went, period. Right. Um, do you know, did you get any information on how your grandmother reacted when she f got that first telegram or notice that he was alive? My cousin told me. Mm -hmm. I'm not real close to my cousins because they're all in California and I grew up in Texas, but we do Facebook and like that. So I asked her because she was born during the war. My cousin was. Mm -hmm. She's the oldest. I'm the youngest. And she said uh, that when the telegram arrived after the war, that he had sent a telegram home that he was released, but that was it. He was sent to the hospital. But anyway, when the initial telegram came that he sent back to California to tell his parents, hey, I made it, that the in those days, everything was telegrams, and they were sent out by taxis because they, they lived out in the, on a farm outside mm -hmm. Visalia, that's his hometown. And so the taxi driver drive, drives up. It's like in you know, Saving Private Ryan in the beginning when the mom gets the telegrams, you know. Mm -hmm. And supposedly she went out and sat on the front steps and wouldn't open the telegram. She just, oh. she just, she just wouldn't open it. And so this taxi driver's like, <laughs> I got a lot of other things to do. So he said, Well, Mrs. Burlich, I'll open it for you. Is that okay? He said, yeah, I have to open it. And he opened it and he just smiled and handed it to her. And it was like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but my cousin also said when he finally made it back to his hometown, she was scared of him because he was so tall and so skinny. Uh, and she started screaming. Because of how unhealthy he looked. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How, how long did it take for him to get back to normal weight? Knowing him not long, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was a big man. Um, they had to do, he had, he was an outpatient for a while, mm -hmm. in a uh, naval hospital in Oakland. Mm -hmm. That was the closest to his hometown is Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. But I would, I'm just guessing here, because I mean, looking at photos of him, mm -hmm. he married my mom in 1950 and he, he looks pretty healthy. Okay. I'd say probably this is photos three or four years. Mm -hmm. the, the cover on the, the, the cover photo is in 1946. You can see he's still kind of, you know, thin. Oh, God. But he, he never had a weight problem. He never had, yeah, let's say he was a big guy. Mm -hmm. He also said that when they finally got out of the, out of the mine in Sendai and made it down to Tokyo, uh, they were, they, they found the Americans in Tokyo and they were like, oh my God, <laughs> what happened to you? Oh, I was locked up for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And um, they were told they kept any food they wanted. And he, my, my dad said he wanted milk, cold milk, cold milk. He wanted something cold. He wanted ice cream and he wanted beer. Okay. I, guess, I guess that beer he got in Palawan didn't last long. <laughs> so anyway, he, um, they, they, they didn't serve beer on you know, ships, on military ships. So they gave him cold chocolate milk mm -hmm. and he couldn't keep it down. Yeah. He'd drink it and he'd throw it up. He'd go, I want another one. And they go, just give me another one. <laughs> because it was, he just wanted it, you know. And um, so finally, they, they realized that his, his, you know, what happens to a lot of people in starvation, his, his you know, shrunk. His stomach is shrunk. But they went to Guam. They sent them to Guam, to a military hospital in Guam. And so he was there like in some, September, maybe mm -hmm. little, little October 45. And the nurses just stocked the refrigerators of ice cream. And they would let the the, uh, the guys get all the ice cream they wanted. Mm -hmm. But again, he still had to, was he still overdoing it, let's say? I'm sure he was, yeah. 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 But something else, I, mean, I, I, I just said, I talk a lot, but um, something that was not addressed with these men was PTSD. Mm -hmm. And he, he would say this to me a lot, you know, he, he was, here he was in Oakland in the hospital and he'd tell doctors, he said, you know, I went through some things that, you wouldn't believe I went through. Mm -hmm. And I would like to sort some of this out. Could I, could I talk to a psychologist, a counselor, somebody? And this doctor said, all you need to do is go home and get a home-cooked meal. You'll be fine. 
a different attitude. And he was up for reenlistment and he wanted to finish school, but he knew he didn't have the, the he, he couldn't do it. He just couldn't do it then. With the, you know, he was restless and you can imagine. And his mother told him, or, or didn't tell him, but she suggested he reenlist mm -hmm. and try to get on, on some cruises and see the world. And just because he was cheated out of a war, really, you know, he, he didn't get, it was just, he was locked up for 40 months. And so he followed her advice and he was um, assigned to the USS New Jersey. And he got to see, like, he went to Europe, he went to the Mediterranean, you know, he saw things. And then he came back and start, started his writing career and everything went well. But he said that that was the best advice he ever got. So did he end up spending, what, eight years, something like that? In the 20, 20 years in Marines. Full 20. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. He had already done six when he was freed. Mm -hmm. Sounds like almost a third of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it just made more sense to mm -hmm. retire and get, get, get some good benefits out of it. You know? <laughs> so. How about, so I guess he didn't have to go to Korea. He did as a combat correspondent. Oh, okay. He wrote, he wrote for the, the Marine Corps. Their, their different publications. So he was in Korea, but he... Mm -hmm. I asked him about that once. Um, he said he carried a, a pistol. Well, from my thing, he had a, he had a weapon, but he never fought. Mm -hmm. Do you know what years or when yeah. he was? There? My parents married in May of 1950. Mm -hmm. They eloped in Las Vegas. It's real, you know. <laughs> and then, um, she, my my mom was teaching in California at the time they met. But anyway, um, he got sent. They, they got sent to San Diego. And he was reassigned to San Diego. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, he's gone. It was the summer of 1950. He was gone like two years. Oh wow! Yeah. But all all that time in Korea. Yeah. Korea, and then he'd go over to Japan, the Philippines, to write stories mm -hmm. on, on assignment. But yeah, that must have been interesting for him to return to Japan. You know, as as, as the winner, basically. You know. Yeah. Well, he he was there with with the Marines, so I bet they they were the winners. <laughs> you know, I can imagine the uh, attitude they had. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you a story about that. Uh, 1967, they did the this uh, the 25th anniversary to follow the Philippines trip. Mm -hmm. My dad went on it, and at that time he had to when he got out of Dallas, he did, we didn't have DFW yet, so he had to keep connecting all over the country you know, to get on mm -hmm. those. But um, he was on a plane long, long enough with a bar that they all got pretty well intoxicated. I think it's a long flight over there. Yeah. And um, anyway, they got to they had to uh, stop in Tokyo to refuel. Mm -hmm. Now my dad claims he didn't do any of this. I don't know, but a bunch of them got off the plane and started running through the airport, yelling "Bonsai, Bonsai!" And so they had to be <laughs> they had to be dragged back on the plane and said, mm -hmm. <laughs> "You don't do this," you know. Yeah. So when they came back, I think the flight was uh, Seattle's where it originated. Mm -hmm. And so on the flight back, uh, they were not allowed off the plane. They had to stay on the plane the whole no. time. So there's, a little bit of, there's a little bit of anger still there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all of them were pr were punished. Not just the, you know, like 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 the teacher, and the, you know, what one kid cuts up, and everybody has to be you know punished for it, you know, like that. Yeah, yeah. So um, okay, so he got so I'm thinking between fifty three and fifty nine. If there was any other conflict, he might have. Um, he covered. I was real little. I don't remember, but I remember he told me he had to go over and cover the Suez Canal thing. Oh, uh, okay. That was in fifty eight or fifty nine. No, we were in Hawaii then. I guess it was probably 57, 56. See, I, 57. I forget. And after that, no, he was stationed in Philadelphia because that's where the um, publications office was located mm, okay. for the whole Corps. And then he went to Camp Lejeune, mm -hmm. North Carolina. I was born there. Oh, okay. And his last one was in Hawaii. Oh, nice. We were living there and became a state. I don't, oh, remember, okay. it. I don't remember it. <laughs> huh. We moved to Texas when I was four. But um, yeah, they, they saw a lot, did a lot. Mm -hmm. So normally, I guess, um, I mean, people like to retire where they're going to settle down if they can, if they can help it. Did he, did he want to live in Hawaii at all? Or was it just a fun time? And then it was a fun time. You know, my mom, my mom grew up in Texas. My dad grew up in California. They were used to expanse, you know, mm -hmm. they were oh, used yeah. to area. And, like I love Hawaii, but I, I wouldn't live there. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm used to being in a car and driving two or three hours or, you know, you know, it's very expensive too. Mm -hmm. And my my mom my mom grew up in the Dallas area and she wanted to come back. So. Mm -hmm. Was he part of any um, 
uh, veterans associations or, or any, any? My dad? My dad? Oh, gosh, yes. He was a, he belonged to the Combat Correspondents Association, mm -hmm. uh, the American, American Defenders of Baton and Corregidor, mm -hmm. which is now the Memorial Society. I'm, I'm an officer in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but he belonged to that, went to all the conventions, the 4th Marines. Mm -hmm. He always made the, the 4th Marines reunion. Um, yeah, he was in quite a few. Uh, Fleet Reserve, something with the Navy. I don't know. I mean, he was. Those, those are the four I remember. Mm -hmm. What uh, What do you What do you think? Um, the fact that he came back and said, "Hey, you know, maybe I should be talking to a psychologist or something." That That sounds very astute of him. You know, what 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 in his upbringing would have given him, you know, the idea? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. His father was the son of a German immigrant, mm -hmm. and. Um, very hard on, very, very hard on. Uh, that was some stuff that I, I edited out of his notes, to be honest, how, how bad his father was. To him. And um, I remember once, once my, my, my dad said that now his father would have been arrested for child abuse. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know the particulars, but, um, but no, I, I don't know. I, I don't think, I don't think in those, those days anybody got help. Mm -hmm. You know, they would try, try to, you know, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like he didn't see any stigma with talking to someone that he was just matter of fact about it. Like, Hey, that. yeah, that's at, pretty cool. At, at least he, he knew he needed help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that the, the writings he did were part of that. Ah, to kind of deal with what he went through. Hmm. When he, when he, uh, after he retired back in the way past when he retired mm -hmm. and my mother passed away, he, he lived with my kids and me. Mm -hmm. Or we lived with him. I don't know which way it worked, but anyway, we were all in the same house. And I'd come home from school and he'd be typing on his old manual typewriter. What are you doing, Dad? Oh, nothing. <laughs> he was writing about his experiences, is what he was doing. Oh. And some, some of those writings were a paragraph and some were pages long. I found an envelope in a book about MacArthur, of all people, and he hated MacArthur. You know? Oh, really? He always hated him. And um, it was the 10 tops, 10 tops hints or suggestions to survive. Hmm. Very, I had it in the book. Very interesting. Oh wow! Very interesting. So you know, he's always saying to be on top of things, to look around. You know, um, be very observant. Mm -hmm. Take advantage of what you can. You know, things like that. I, mean, I found writings everywhere. It's interesting that he was, um, and not like I want to psychoanalyze your dad, but he was involved with the veterans associations, and he wrote. He was a journalist, and he was mm -hmm. writing. Do you think he right. wanted to eventually publish this or was it just to, just to jot I think, it down? I think it was just a, a matter of, of a release for him. Mm -hmm. He honestly thought that no one would care. Mm -hmm. He always said that. And I'd say, would you please come speak to my classes? I taught, um, I taught AP World History. I go, come mm -hmm. talk to my classes. They don't care. I said, they'll care. Trust me, <laughs> they'll care. Mm -hmm. always standing behind him going, <laughs> but yeah, they, they were wonderful. They'd ask questions. They were so interested and he was just this old man, you know, and they were, I mean, he didn't think anybody cared. Mm -hmm. He really didn't, care, you know, and I think part of that was that the treatment, the way that POWs were considered when he was appealed, you know, after, after the war, I mean, he, he told me that he went home, you know, back in his hometown in the Valley of California and walked into a bar. It's old hanging a bar they hung out with when he was home. And he heard somebody say, that's George, he got captured. He got captured, he's a coward. And one guy even went up to him and said, hey, George, how did you let yourself get captured? They had no understanding, no understanding. They thought that they had all just given up. They were cowards. Yeah. And I think that that always was the back of his mind. Mm. Wow. Yeah. No respect, even even then. No, no, no. no. So, do you, do you know if these were statements made by people who had not been in the military, who just sometimes they were. Yeah, they just thought they knew better of what it, what what it was like. Hmm. That's uh, wow. That's pretty bad. Um. You well, know, the, the, the ironic thing was during the war, his his brother was in the navy. Mm -hmm. My uncle was in the navy, and my dad, of course, in the Marines. And both of their sisters married the old term 4F, you know, they were turned down for the draft. Mm -hmm. They both married 4F guys during the war. Mm. And they never got along with those men. It was pretty bad. You know? yeah. 
Uh, so what? It must have been a time. It must have been a time. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. You know, we get we get these general statements of how people were back then, but when you really dig in and you get individual stories, you start to learn about the little intricacies of people's people's yeah. attitudes and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's uh, from from what my, my mom would say. She was in college during the war. She graduated yeah. in forty three, and she said, of course, the day after Pearl Harbor, they had actually no men in her, her you know in North Texas, mm -hmm. but also. Um, Everybody was so patriotic and pumped up, and you know, we're gonna go fight the Germans and the uh, and the other guys. You know, they were big on the Japanese, though, except for the bombing of Pearl Harbor. But she said it was that, that initial fervor, this patriotism. We're gonna go get them, and as the war kept dragging on, dragging on, dragging on, you know, that that, that kind of went. It was this endurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of, I, you know, like COVID, kind of like COVID. You know, the uh, mass fatigue and all of that. Yeah. You know, you're, you're in it for so long, you just it was interest, I guess. I don't know. But I, the thing about World War II is that everybody knew somebody that was in it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. It, but yeah. yeah. Actually, I interviewed someone who studied the draft, especially in World War II, and, and she found that a lot, of, a lot of American men were actually trying to stay out of the war by, you know, using marriage or college, you know, that, right. you know, that a lot of them were, yeah, they were patriotic, but they were like, let the other guy take care of it. Exactly, like Vietnam. Yeah. Mm. So what part of the research was most enjoyable for you? And I can guess the answer, but. This is enjoyable. I felt like I really got to really know my dad. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff he had never told me or shared with me. Mm -hmm. And I'm an only child. You would think I'd know everything, wouldn't you? <laughs> but um, also, I just learned a lot about about the will to live is very strong. Hmm. It's very, very strong hmm. for most people. You know, um, he felt cheated. You know, he really kind of felt cheated that he missed most of the war. I mean, he had one battle, which wasn't much. Hmm. And he was, just, well, I would say he was angry, he was disappointed, you know. But no matter what had happened to him, and no one could have ever predicted, you know, what, 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 what these men were going to go through. You know, I mean, you know, forced marches and hell ships and starvation and all that. Hmm never lost the will, mm -hmm. never gave up. And um, he, wrote, he wrote about when the, when he, okay, when he enlisted, the U.S. military didn't have much. It was very small. There were 15,000 Marines. Mm -hmm. I mean, it didn't have much for military. Mm -hmm. And they had no weapons at all. It, it took us a year to get any kind of weapons developed. But when he, he said, when he went into Tokyo, when he was freed, and saw this, you know, I don't know what she was, but stern to stern, whatever ships lined up in Tokyo Bay. Mm -hmm. And he thought, all oh, this has happened. <laughs> what has happened here? This is the United States. And he, he often said it was like he, he was in a movie and they stopped the movie. And he never, you know, all these things were happening, but he didn't know about them. He didn't know who the president was. Because, you know, Truman, he didn't know. Uh, he had no idea what had happened. They knew nothing. And the Japanese would come in and lie to them about we had big battle in Jima. We we killed those Americans. Well, yeah, they did, but they didn't. We, you know, it was a little bit worse for the Japanese, or yeah. they they wouldn't tell the truth about right. battles and things. And of course, you know, there wasn't any fighting for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. You know, they they never heard a plane. They never heard anything. And just that he he said he had to catch up on life. He had to catch up. He didn't know what had happened. He read about all the battles and everything in World War Two and. You know, it, he just—he was just isolated, totally cut off from the world, and how he came through that so well and had such a good life. Yeah. You know, it wasn't bitter, really. You know, he just picked it up and went on. I really admire that. And to get personal, I went through it. I think everyone's everyone's nasty, but thirty some years ago, I went through a divorce. I was devastated. It wasn't my choice, and. Um, that's when I learned a lot about my dad and giving up. He said, don't let him win. Don't let him win. If you let him win, he will control your life. I let it go. You let it go. Mm -hmm. And that was just a, it's such good advice. Oh, yeah. You yeah. don't let so, someone else determine your life for you. Yeah. And that's what he did for the Japanese. He, wasn't gonna, he was not going to let it go. Hmm. I came out with a really strong, strong admiration for him yeah. as a person. Yeah. Not just as a father, but as a person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So and what, all, all those men too, all those men, you know? Yeah. Um, what did you find in your research that most surprised you? I came out being very angry at how that whole, okay, I'm, I'm going to be nice about this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those men were abandoned. Mm -hmm. They were dumped. They were abandoned. And the only battle plan, and, and this was part, part of the background research I had to do too, was, you know, about the battle plan for the Philippines and all that. Mm -hmm. They were going to get them reinforcements. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Those men were doomed from the beginning. There was no no intention of saving those people or helping them out. Mm -hmm. It took six weeks for a ship to get to the Philippines. How are how they going to get them reinforcements? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was, and then he had MacArthur. Oh, I know FDR told him to go, but he made a lot of mistakes before he went. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it was just so badly handled. Mm -hmm. And I just kept getting angrier and angrier about it. You know, the United States shouldn't couldn't do that to their just abandoned people. Yeah. But they did, and only half of them lived. Mm. And that really made me angry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't blame you. Mm -hmm. So what what uh, precisely was your dad mad at MacArthur about? Because he left, or was there other stuff? MacArthur did not did not like Marines. Uh. Um, something about World War One. he thought that the Marines got to too much credit for things. Uh. In the last battle, I'm not... Bella Wood, or one of those last battles. Bella Wood, yeah. Bella Wood. There was a, a large number of Marines that were killed. And they got all this credit for being courageous and brave and all this stuff. And he didn't like it. Hmm. He, he said that the, the Army was not, was not given the credit it should, it should get. Hmm. He was an egotist, come on. Yeah. yeah he I mean, <laughs> wearing this pipe in his hat, and, you know. Yeah. And um, he also... When he left, you know, he, he, he I, I guess he had to go. I guess, you know, FDR told him to go. Mm -hmm. And it would have been a big prize to have gotten him as a, as a POW. Yeah, it would have been a big prize. Yeah. But um, like Arthur told Wainwright, who was the commander at Corregidor, to fight to the last man, mm -hmm. not surrender. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, Wayne, Wainwright didn't do that. And he spent the, he spent the war as a POW. And... Um, he just didn't like my brother. He, he, he didn't think he was a good leader. He didn't think he was a good leader at all. Yeah, yeah. And, and he, 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 was, he was more for MacArthur than he was for anybody else. You know, he was, MacArthur wanted him to be publicized. You know, he wanted all the credit. Right. And like somebody, well, I won't get into that, but anyway. I'm, <laughs> I, I haven't read much on MacArthur, so, you know, I'm, I'm not going to dispute that or, you know. No, I'm, he was really, um, I read a book, really excellent book about the, the battle for Manila. I didn't know there was a battle for Manila. Mm -hmm. But I, man, I learned during this book, and I didn't know there was a like huge land battle mm -hmm. when the Americans came back in the Philippines. Yeah. And the Japanese made, made their last stand in Manila, it killed hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. And but before he left Manila, MacArthur in 1941 and around Christmas, he had his Cadillac pushed into Manila Bay because he didn't want anybody to, to get his Cadillac. Uh. You know, things like that, just yeah. Yeah. You know, statistical. Mm -hmm. And supposedly the, the, the men in battle in the Philippines, would, when they went to, to go to the bathroom or train or whatever, they go, I shall return. Mm -hmm. You know, to, 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 because that's why he said when he left, you know, I shall return. Yeah. No, he, uh, <laughs> but yeah. that's just my opinion. I mean, you know. Hey, fair enough. And, and it's from, it's from a, a, a personal viewpoint, you know. Mm -hmm. Was there, um, did you come across anything in the writings that you really you didn't understand and you wanted to get an answer for to understand what your dad was talking about and maybe it took a while before you figured it out or you, or you still don't know and you want to figure it out oh uh, there were times that i wish that he had told more about what happened mm -hmm. you know maybe tell a bit more um some of the instances that he described some of the torture and mm. things like that. I, I guess he, he just didn't want to share it, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, not really, no. Okay, okay. Um, so obviously this is probably, a, you know, an emotional uh, work for you to, uh, a, emotional piece for you to work on. 
was there anything that really hit you emotionally, like either positive or negative? You know, you were talking about the, the will to survive. Well, yeah, definitely when, that. Definitely that. Was there anything else that really, that really struck you emotionally? And I don't want you to get too, you know, I'm not trying. No, I'm, to... I'm not a real emotional person, so don't worry. Sure, sure. I, I never realized, I don't know why, those men totally lost their freedom. They totally lost their freedom for 40 months. Mm -hmm. They were told what to do, where to go. You know, they, they had no control of their lives for 40 months. And that's what got me because um, I just can't imagine that. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're put behind fences. He used to say, what's the expression we said? Well, how is life behind a barbed fence? A bar mm -hmm. Barbed wire fence. I'll tell you about life behind a barbed wire fence. <laughs> You'd start. Um, just to have no control over your lives. Yeah. I, I just I just kept thinking about that, you know. And then you have disease and and, and you know beating and total isolation. The isolation. Yeah. I just my dad and I know I am rambling, but he loved to be outside. Mm -hmm. We had a farm. I always call, call it a play farm. Mm -hmm. We had a farm outside our, our city and he'd go out there and just build fences and you know do things like that and we had a beautiful yard. He'd like to be outside. And I think that was part of that was a, you know, a, a, from, from the POW does, you know, he just liked to be on his own mm -hmm. and he liked to be outside. And he liked to do what he wanted to do. <laughs> and I have a, I just know that that was hard on him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can imagine. Um, so did you have any, so you did mention some of the difficulties in, getting the book published, but did you have any other difficulties in finishing it up or getting it published? I think I was very, very lucky because mm -hmm. I had more or less thought, well, you know, I have, a, I have some friends in my POW descendant group who wrote about their dads and they all had to self-publish everyone. Mm -hmm. And I met the author of that book about when Ella was talking about, I met him at a POW function mm -hmm. and he and I were just chatting and I said, would you have any advice about publishing a book? He said, first thing he said, he said do not self-publish. Mm. Don't do it because you're going to have to do all the publicity. I've done a lot of that anyway, but, you know, but I have, I have guidance how to do it, mm -hmm. but you have to do everything. You have to pay to get it published. Mm -hmm. And he said, just don't do it. Just, just, if you, if you can't get a publisher, just make copies for your, for your kids, but you know, like that. And so I was very, very lucky. I just thought, you know, UNT press, we, we all went to University of North Texas. Uh, why not? You know, and this author said they're a, a top publisher for for um, war history, military history. That's really good, and, you know, and they were wonderful. They were wonderful. As I said before, I knew when I sent them the manuscript. Um, you know, I, I initially emailed the editor and said, "Hey, I've done this book," and you know, and he said, "What well, is? Send it to me." You know, please. And um, I I I knew it was rough. I mean, you know, it was. I knew there'd be a lot of changes, and there were, and everything that they asked me to do was right. You know, it turned out to be, I'm, I'm very proud of what, how it turned out. And um, it was a very smooth process, I would say that, very, very smooth. They, they were wonderful to work with, and I was very lucky, very, very lucky, I know. Good, good. Do you, are you writing anything else now, or is that your I mind? have ideas, but, you know, this this one was kind of like, I know how to, it was like, you had the foundation, you had the you know, I mean, I had some. I thought I had some, something really different there. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Because the, because the other POW books I've read are written who are written by descendants or like they're not real personal. Mm -hmm. You know, what I mean, they're not into the emotions and all of that. They're just they just told what happened. Mm -hmm. so I knew I had something special, mm -hmm. and I don't know. Does does lightning strike twice? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. But, um, I have ideas, but I don't. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. We'll see. Okay. We'll see. Do you have a? Any website or anything to promote the book or? Facebook. Facebook, okay. So the, uh, the, pu the publisher's website. Yeah, the publisher's website. And you'd be surprised how many people were on, on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it got published and I thought only I would publish a book during a pandemic. <laughs> no, a lot of people did. <laughs> You're not alone. <laughs> I know, I'm not. I couldn't do book signings. I couldn't make appearances. But you know, we made it work. Mm hmm he made it work through Zoom. I've got a lot of civic groups. Oh, good. Book clubs. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they're friends mainly, but I've been busy with this. 
um, the local paper here did a really nice article on it. Um, my my dad was the editor there in the early 1960s, so hmm. they had to do it, yeah. And but they did a good article. Um, I did a driveway book signing. Mm-hmm. I set up on my on my driveway under a big POW flag, and oh, wow. everybody get their books signed. That right. went really well. Oh, cool! You'd have to be imaginative. Um, I, you know, I had green with a big book signing with wine and appetizers, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe, yeah. maybe over on the UNT campus or something. But mm-hmm. wasn't to be. You yeah. had to be imaginative, but um, it sold pretty well. I mean, it's it's, it's not going to be a top ten bestseller, and I knew that. Mm-hmm. But um, I've signed a lot of books, and you know, it's it's, it's been a really good process. It's a, and I really wanted people to know about mainly about the hell ships, but about what these men went through. Yeah. And I've had a lot of people go, we had no idea. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember the movie Unbroken or the book Unbroken? Um, about I Louis, think- Louis Zaffarini and he'd been, a, he'd been in the Olympics in 36 and then he got into the war and he got, he oh, was, right. on, you know, he was in a plane shot down there on a raft like for 30 some days. I think I've heard of that. Yeah. Were rescued by the Japanese, <laughs> rescued. You know? yeah. Well, I went to see that movie and I went by myself because I wasn't sure how, it, what kind of reaction I'd have. And I had no reaction really. Mm-hmm. But uh, he was put in a camp like my dad was in Japan. He was a minor. Mm-hmm. And um, so after the movie, as all women do immediately, they went to the, went to the bathroom. You know? <laughs> so I'm standing in line in the bathroom and I heard this woman behind me go, I can't believe the Japanese or whatever that mean. <laughs> I thought, hey, George Ann, how are you going to handle this one? Oh, boy. How are you going to handle that? Oh, boy. So I was very calm, and I turned around, and I said, um, my, my dad was a POW of the Japanese, and he was in a camp like Louie was in, and they were. They were. Yeah. It, 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 was, it was not a good experience, you know. They were, they were pretty cruel. Yeah. And they took me and just said, is, is he doing all right now? Yeah. And well, he passed away in 2008, but he had a good life, yeah. Yeah. But honey, when you're in history class, did you sleep through it? Come on, yeah. you know. They might, yeah. they might not have taught it. I don't know. Yeah. But you know, I just hope that I, 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 I'm, you know, that I may have given us new information and mm-hmm. seen something new here. I, I hope I did. Yeah, I think so. At least personally, you know, I'm not familiar with some of the stuff you mentioned. You know, I, I'm familiar with the POW experience in general, but you know, like you say, the hell ship and other things. Um, you ask most people they know of a POW, they'll probably say McCain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he has a wonderful quote about how, how he has seen the worst of life and the best of life. And that's a gorgeous quote. I, I use it when I do Zoom talks with people. Mm-hmm. But my dad always said that he had it much worse than, and that John McCain had it much worse than he did. Mm-hmm. Because John McCain was kept in a room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And my and my, my my dad worked, but he could he could find food. You know, he he was outside. He loved being outside most of the time. Mm-hmm. But McCain sat in a room yeah. alone. Yeah. So they're all varying kinds of POWs. So the, the ones in the Civil War at Andersonville, or all these. I mean, it's just a yeah, quite a story. Yeah. Korea, the ones in Korea didn't you know that that never came back. And mm-hmm. Yeah. So there there's some stories there. Yeah. I, I would never try to rate who had the worst piano. Oh, no, I wouldn't either. <laughs> no, like, I appreciate what your dad said, but, yeah. you know. Um, well, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Let me make sure I wrote down some things. But I think we covered all of it. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say that this is one man's, one man's story, mm-hmm. what he went through. And there's so many untold stories. And I guess we're never going to know some of these stories right. because most of the guys from World War II have left us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure. But one thing I did was my um, my POW descendants group, and they're not. This is not, it's not a big group. It's, it's just for Breton and Corregidor. Mm-hmm. But we do a quarterly newsletter, and I wrote an article challenging other descendants to find out your father's stories or your grandfather's stories, right? Because these stories should be told. Yeah, it should really be told. Mm-hmm. And I've asked, I had students, and uh, I, I'd make them do a project. Well, I didn't make them, but I heavily suggested. Okay, <laughs> they do a project on whatever ancestor they had had been in World War One or World War Two mm-hmm. when we did the war, World War unit. And yeah. um, I had parents who would thank me for that because they found out things about their their ancestors they had no idea. Yeah, and like one one girl, her 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 
grandmother was a nurse in Italy during the war, like Anzio and all that. He, they didn't know. They had started digging for it. There are all kinds of stories that really need to be told. And I just challenge everybody to find that story. Yeah. Because that was a generation that, you know, as I said, we, we would take selfies today on the beach at Normandy, you know. Yeah. And I would just, <laughs> I just like, like to get that out, you know. <laughs> yeah, but if you know something, share it. Yeah. Share it. Yeah. Write, write an article or something. Just let us know. Mm -hmm. And um, my dad always said that he felt forgotten by his country. Mm -hmm. he, he began to think, do, do they even know we're here? Mm -hmm. And um, these guys, they, they went through so much. Yeah. And their, their story should be told. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah, I definitely think people need to, to read this. Especially the part about tips on how to survive. I think that's really, that's really interesting. <laughs> well, he was very matter of fact about stuff, you know. <laughs> hey, I appreciate it. And people had asked me what the long term result of being a POW was for my dad. Well, I didn't know him before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's kind of hard to say anything. But um, as I said, I was born after the war was over. But he was the most generous man you've ever met. He was so generous. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would. You know, he'd, have, he'd, he'd buy blankets for the homeless here in, my, in our city because he said that he knew how, how it felt to be cold because in Japan it was very, very cold. Right. Um, he worked with charities. Uh, you know, he really liked like the Salvation Army. He paid my, the college tuition for both my daughters, to give you an example. And I say, Dad, you don't have to do this. And he go, no, I'm so thankful I survived. I'm just thankful that I'm here and I can do it. Yeah. And I think that was just a wonderful thing. He, he appreciated life. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Well, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. And good <laughs> luck hope, with the book. And, I hope you can uh, use something in there. So thank okay. you. Can you show the book again? I still can't get the... Um... <laughs> it goes into the palm tree. Is that Hawaii? <laughs> I don't know. It's just a background. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Living in the shadow of a hell ship. Thank you very much for speaking with me. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video version of Military History Inside Out. If you like this episode, please subscribe for more. If you want daily book suggestions for new military history and general American and world history, including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar 1945, and my website, warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for new fiction and nonfiction books on sci-fi, fantasy, horror, gaming, film history, and more, check out chrisalvarez.com and my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you want new technology, science, space history, and space books, check out technologyandspace.com and my podcast, Technology and Space. Thank you for listening.